Okay, our Swiss train is running almost exactly on time, so our, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Dan. Someone asked me for my card. I don't remember who they were. Somebody asked me for my. Oh, I see him. For my card. Sorry. I couldn't find him. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dan Lin. He's the chief of urologic oncology at the University of Washington. He also has an appointment here at uh, Fred Hutch. Uh, he's been a, really a national leader in active surveillance as well as other forms of prostate cancer management. Um, and he's going to lead off the discussion of a number of really exciting areas in non-invasively monitoring cancer and more effectively diagnosing localized cancer. And then we'll move into the uh, diagnosing and understanding more advanced disease uh, shortly after. So, Dan? Great, thanks. Well, good morning, and uh, on behalf of the IPCR, welcome. Uh, I really appreciate everyone coming out. We really enjoy interacting with everybody and, and fielding questions and giving you a little bit of a flavor of not only the standard uh, nationally with prostate cancer, but then what we're doing here locally here in the Puget Sound area in Seattle and the Northwest. Um, you could sort of name this next, these next three or four talks, uh, do I have cancer, uh, where is it, uh, how to find it. Um, and I think that this is sort of the cutting edge aspects about diagnostics, first of all, and, and finding out where it is. Um, one of my mentors uh, used to say if we could ever find prostate cancer, if we could ever image prostate cancer better, we will make the greatest leaps. And, and maybe, of course, there's drugs, but there's these imaging aspects, and I think that we have actually climbed up some steps uh, of, uh, and leaped over some hurdles of imaging. I'm going to focus on, on localized prostate cancer, so earlier prostate cancer. And then we'll be talking about what's very important, obviously, is if it's ever come back, if it's, is it distantly, and Evan, you will give us some insights on that, and then we'll go to some other uh, markers in the blood of the urine or things that we can do that don't need any fancy equipment necessarily, just need a sample of your blood, a uh, sample of your urine. So I'll be talking today about multi-parametric MRI and, and its utility for detection and in surveillance. I lead a very large surveillance program uh, in, in the world. It's part of the biggest one in the world. Um, and we won't talk about that except for at the very end of how this might play into it. So here's the topics that I'll, I'll cover. I think we gotta step back again and talk about not necessarily where the prostate is, we know where that is. But even within the prostate, there's anatomy even within that little gland. It's an amazing uh, way it's designed. Then talk about what's standard of care, <clears throat> what's still standard of care today, and then finally end with MRI and what we're doing here and others are doing, but really what, what the promise of the future is um, with prostate imaging. So this is the normal prostate. Now you've seen many pictures of this, but what you might not realize is even within the prostate itself, there are different zones within the prostate. So uh, zone one is the peripheral zone. We call it the peripheral zone. Um, and this is the zone where uh, almost all the cancer occurs. So we don't really know that, and, and if I get the pointer here, this is the, the side of the prostate that we can feel with our finger in doing a digital examination. This is where almost all the prostate occurs. There's a zone called the central zone. No cancer occurs there. There's a transition zone, and this is the zone that as it grows, it constricts the tube and causes blockage. And there was a question earlier about symptoms from urinary leakage. Well, that's, that's very likely just aging prostate. It's not a symptom of prostate cancer because very few prostate cancers occur in this transition zone. And then there's something up here called the anterior fibromuscular zone. Again, no cancers from there. We don't worry about that zone. I have a lot of people, patients come in and say, you can only feel one side of my round prostate. What about the other side? Well, the other side really we don't worry about. It just histologically, biologically will not form cancer. So we don't, we don't have a problem with that side. So this is the zone that we're interested in. I think it's, it's, it's important for you to know this anatomy. Just it relates to the MRI and how we use it. So this is actually, let me just go back. Um, so this uh, next slide is if I cut the prostate right here in the middle. If I'm cutting right down the middle and looking right down the urethra, this is what you see here. You see uh, the middle of the, this is where your, your urine comes out. And then this is the transition zone that might compress on that tube. And this is the peripheral zone out here. Okay. And here's the rectum where we might place our finger or a probe to biopsy the prostate up through here. Okay, so that's the typical prostate anatomy. I kind of have to know that for the rest of this talk. So you've seen this slide again. This is how uh, this is where the prostate is. This is your, your, your bladder right here. When it fills with urine and it's full, you, you ex the urine exits right through your prostate and then out. And here's your, here's your prostate. Here's where we feel your prostate or here's where we might take a biopsy. 
So the standard of care is a transrectal ultrasound biopsy. And I know many of you in the room have, have undergone this procedure and it's really come a long way. I won't go through all the aspects of it. Now we at least use anesthesia. When I was in training 20 years ago, we, we didn't, amazingly didn't even put Novocaine or Lidocaine in there. Uh, uh, ama amazingly, yeah, it, and I know a lot. But, but, I, but surprisingly many men, uh, there's less sensation above what we call the dentate line, which is, which is about right here in, men, in most men. In any event, we've come a long way, and this has been done for the last 30, 40 years, this type of a biopsy. Approximately a million biopsies are done a year in the United States, almost a million. And the majority of them, 700,000 of them, will, will be negative. Luckily, they'll, they will not have prostate cancer. But it's in that, in that range. So how can we improve this? Well, first of all, and I think Marion and uh, I think uh, Ruth mentioned this, that we used to only basically take six little biopsies from the prostate. But then we've realized we have to do better, and we had all sorts of schemes. Now, this is the one that we use traditionally. We divide the prostate right down the middle, right down the middle, and we have right side and left side. And then we divide it up into base, mid, and apex. And I would say that 90% of the world does their biopsies this way. We just divide it up into 12 areas, and we, take, we try to take one biopsy from each area. We don't usually take biopsies of what's called the seminal vesicles, but we usually biopsy these 12 areas. Now, I'll pause and I'll tell you there have been, I don't know, hundreds of papers written on how to do a biopsy better. And this is just one of them, showing all these 16 regions and 27 regions and how to do it. Well, we've realized that certainly we can do better biopsies, but 12 is the standard, and it's transrectally uh, uh, done. Now, there's, there's different influences of the age of the patient. Um, this is, I'm showing a younger prostate, so young, I'm, I'm just saying young, I'm not going to put an age to that. But the, the rectum is right here, we biopsy, again, we're interested in this white area, not the middle here. The middle here is what causes your symptoms having to get up at night, having to go a lot, can't go very well, decreased flow. That's from this transition zone that really doesn't harbor cancer. Okay, so we're not really concerned about that. We want to biopsy this area out here. Now, as men age, naturally, the prostate gets bigger, but it mostly gets bigger because this zone just pushes out on the prostate. And so we actually have to modify the way we do our biopsies. We really, what we call laterally direct our biopsies, and I'm telling you this, this is so-called older, right? There's no age there, but it is as, as men age, all of our prostates just get a little bigger, and most of it's getting bigger here, not where the cancer forms. Okay, so again, I want to stress that symptoms really aren't, aren't associated with prostate cancer. In fact, most men with prostate cancer don't have symptoms, and that's really important for you to know and tell your friends and family that just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean you don't, you know, you don't have prostate cancer. So what about the limitations of this that we've realized for, for, for really years and years and more is are we doing those biopsies very well? Well, they're not always well distributed. I'll show you an example of that. They're extremely operator dependent. So I might do a biopsy, and I think that we, and, and Jonathan Wright, who was here earlier, and we, we really train our residents to do a really well distributed biopsy, and we have strategies to do that, which I won't get into here in training. But it clearly results in some understanding. I'll show an example. So this is an example. And this was a study that someone published, and it's true that if this is the prostate gland here, and the green dots are where you want to put them, the red dots are sometimes where people put them. In fact, um, there was a conference, um, we have a national conference every year, and they had a phantom, like a little gel that was actually a, a, a phantom, a mimic of a prostate. And they had a urologist coming through the booth and biopsying them. And they would just say, do your regular biopsy and then we'll show you where you'd actually did it. <laughs> and, I, and, and I would watch and I would sit there and watch. And, and the, you want to have the greens. And there were a lot, of, a lot of people that looked like the reds. Because it's not as precise as you might think. And I know that that's true. So obviously, if there was, a, if there was even a fairly large cancer that was sitting right here, uh, and that would normally be hit by the green, it would have been missed. So how have we here at the University of Washington uh, improved on this? Well, we try, we, we're now doing what's called MRI technology. Um, now others have tried other strategies, and here I'll show you one example. So this is the typical, what we call transrectal biopsy down here, where we biopsy the rectum. There are others that have done it right through the skin between the scrotum and the anus, basically, right in the skin down there called transperineal, and go right in the prostate. And it is, it can potentially sample a little bit better, and I'll show you some schema of this. This is your prostate, this is your rectum. We normally biopsy just directly through like this. On this, we would actually put a little template here, and it looks like, looks like Battleship. You know, basically go down to B3 and put a needle in there. I mean, 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. It's sort of, I mean, people that have been in the opera, now you have to go to the opera room for this because I'll show you in the next slide why. But you just go down and you say, yeah, C3, you know, E5, little E, big F, things like that. And, and we go in there and we sample it very um, discreetly. So this is an example of it. We put a template here and we just biopsy. And we, this person, we might biopsy, one, two, three, four, yeah, eight, eight times three, 24 biopsies. Okay, obviously their patient's asleep uh, <laughs> under, under anesthesia. And this is called a template biopsy and others have done this. It's a saturation biopsy. Uh, you can count, that's a lot of numbers, 45, 50 biopsies, okay? Now I think that there's, there are reasons to do this and I'll pause now and I'll tell you, there might be men that perhaps have undergone radiation therapy that might have a recurrent prostate cancer and it might only be in their prostate. And to really map their prostate, well, we have done this. And if I find that the cancer is, let's say, only in this region of the prostate, there are therapies like cryotherapy to freeze just that area of the prostate. And we've done that. And I just did a cryotherapy last week in a man that only had prostate cancer on his left apex at mid, and that's what we froze. And hopefully he'll do quite well. Okay, so th there is a reason to do this. It looks horrid, um, and, uh, but it, it, there is a reason to do a saturation biopsy. What have we done instead? Is there something that's gonna take the place of saturation biopsy? I think so, and we're doing it here, which is MRI. Okay, so an MRI is, is just like, like a CT with magnet, no radiation exposure. I think the, word, the words on this aren't, aren't as important as there are different phases of an MRI. You might go in and get an MRI of your knee, an MRI of your shoulder, an MRI of your back. Those are very common MRIs. It's just a, there are a couple phases of that MRI. In this, there are four phases, and there's really a fifth and a sixth, which I'm not showing. So this is a little different from just saying, I'm getting an MRI on my knee. No, this is a multi-parametric MRI. There are four, there's a T2, T1, DWI, and all these letters, um, the alphabet soup of MRI, but they're really distinctly different phases, and I'll show you that right now. I won't go through this, too, it's just too much. So this is the, this is the picture of an MRI. Um, this is the picture of an MRI in, in, in a T2 phase, and here's the prostate. And it's remarkable that the prostate, so this whole thing here, the peripheral zone is this white area, and the transition zone is this dark area. Okay, this is the BPH, as men age, pushes on the prostate gland, and here's a picture of a, li a, a prostate cut in half. We, when we see a prostate cancer in this zone, it's dark, and, it, and it's usually pretty subtle, although I'll show you a very obvious example. You can see here, there's a big example of a tumor. It's clear, it's very clear. You will not see that on ultrasound. If I do an ultrasound, it will not look like that only an MRI. So how can we take advantage of that? There's also something called DWI. It's the opposite. It's actually bright. So you can see a bright face here or a dark face on the T2. And then when we look at the prostate itself, there's the cancer. It corresponds right to where you see it. And there's the last phase where we actually infuse contrast into the patient. Of course, many of you have gone through CT scans or MRIs. And it actually, it draws up the contrast. It says, that's what I like. It, 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 the, the blood supply is more out of cancer, and indeed, it draws it up into that area and it lights up. Anybody can see it lights up. I will say these are the most ideal examples. Some, they're usually very small, and the radiologist, and that's why I'm not a radiologist, uh, get paid to find these little areas and tell us where they are. So what do we do once we find out? Now we have to standardize the way we read MRIs. I won't go into it now. There's a huge momentum nationally and internationally to try to simplify and standardize the terminology um, and to develop better categories and educate radiologists because it's a new field. This is a whole new frontier and I think it's wonderful that they're going through this education of all the radiologists. They came up with this thing called PIRATS. It's prostate radiation evaluation. And they came up with a five point score and it goes one through five. Many of you have these. Um, it's one is very low and two is low, unlikely. Three is where we start to pay attention. And we say, maybe, maybe not equivocal. Four is high and five is very high, high suspicion. I kind of don't like the system. I've talk, talked to them about it quite a bit. I was at Yale last week with the MRI folks in a consensus conference talking about how can we modify this? Because honestly, those two don't count. If someone's got a one and a two, we kind of throw it out the window. I know many of you know Gleason scoring. There is no Gleason one, two, three, four, or five, it kind of starts at least in six. Why do we even have, you know, this is very confusing, you know. Why start a thing at six? Well, why start a, a grading scheme at three? So they might change eventually to be one through three. That's what I propose, and that's what I think we should do. Regardless, we have a grading scheme, and what do we do then? We take the MRI, and this, this is, it's a fascinating technology. We take the MRI, and we take the ultrasound, and we fuse them together into one. 
And then there's a computer program that makes it, they call it elastic, uh, for all the engineers in the room, elastic interpolation where they actually, we're pushing on the prostate with our probe, the MRI yeah. isn't, so they have to somehow meld it together. And it's fa fascinating, after we get it together, we can say, here's the MRI, there's the lesion that, the, uh, that they found in the MRI, can 3D reconstruct it. Here is the ultrasound, and we can draw a little dot around. Now, see here, this little indention here is my probe. There's no indention on the MRI. So they somehow fuse these together in this magical engineering land, and they say, okay, now here's, the, here's where you need to go, and these little lines are how to do the biopsy. And if anyone's, and, and I don't, didn't have a video, I couldn't download the video, but it's almost like, have you seen Top Gun, where they're flying around, and they, then they, they get the plane, and there's a target lock. And that's exactly what happens on this MRI. You're going around, and then there's this bullseye that all of a sudden comes up and has this red dot in the middle, and then you fire fire the, the instrument. I mean, it's like a high price. It's a high price video game. Okay, um, it's, a, it's a quarter million dollar actually machine, and the machine's about this big. So, but that's what it does for us, and it very precisely within a millimeter lets us um, place the needle where we want it to place it. Not only does it do that, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up here, I'm getting the high sign here, is that after we fuse uh, the images, we can actually have it tell us, give, it, give me the 12 most distributed dots. Because what's very important, I'll end with this, is that despite the MRI being very good in saying, okay, there's a red lesion here, there's a green lesion here, they sometimes miss lesions over here. And so we still, at this point in time, are not confident that these are the only lesions in the prostate. I'm going to end with a couple things. There have been, again, 300 publications on MRI in the last couple of years, 300. Um, somebody tried to distill it down and they came up with 12 that were the best and even those 12 had some issues. The accuracy could be 86%, but it could be as low as 33. Not the greatest, right? We're working on it here, okay? Of course, I have a great issue in active surveillance. Can we do it for active surveillance? Basically, it says if your MRI is negative, you have a pretty good chance you don't have bad disease in there. The problem is if your MRI is positive, it's not always true either. So there's issues that we're working through here. We're working to do it during active surveillance. And again, many of you I know are involved in this, this work with us with MRI. And eventually we might get to the point where we have a PSA high or a nodule. We get an MRI, if it's negative, we just watch. If it's positive, we do a biopsy, of course, low risk, active surveillance and so forth. We're gonna get there eventually. There are unbelievable cost issues and again, I'm on the line with the insurance people on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, approval uh, process, and it's very difficult sometimes, but we're working through that. Targeting methods still can miss the cancer, which I, I said before, there's false positives. Um, it's likely not needed in everybody. And if I may have a tiny little bit of low-grade, low PSA cancer, we're not necessarily gonna be pushing for an MRI, uh, but it is one of those things we're considering. And I, again, I think it's, it's superior to standard MRI. We do this image fusion uh, idea, and at the end of the day, it doesn't replace regular biopsy yet, um, but stay tuned. I think, I think eventually one of these years here at this symposium, I hope to give you good news that it does. So I thank you for your attention and we can chat at the <laughs>